Hi hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be talking about degradation in, uh, well, of chips in overclocking. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm very, very, very fast at writing. <laughs> I don't type much faster either, so <laughs> does, does not really a good thing, is it? Um, so, anyway. So basically, well, first of all, this is an extremely complicated topic, and there are many, many very long, very difficult papers written about, well, all of this. Um, and so I cannot, like, and I've tried reading quite a few of them, um, but the physics are just so far over my head in a lot of cases where it's like, okay, um, I do not know everything about this. I may make some mistakes. And this is mostly going to be covered from a sort of more, um, like, it's going to be covered, for, like, from my level of understanding, which is not complete whatsoever. Um, but the thing is, I've seen a lot of people sort of, well, the, the thing is, Ryzen's voltage management um, basically, like, makes sense within my understanding of degradation. But for a lot of people, when they see their Ryzen CPU, you know, boosting single-threaded to one and running on 1.45 volts, uh, doesn't make any sense to them. Just does not compute whatsoever. So, um, yeah, we're we're gonna try. So, so that's kind of the point of me doing this video. Is like I, you know, definitely don't know everything there is to know about this. Um, I might have some misunderstandings about how some of the mechanics um, behind. Uh, what happens with degradation of chips, but uh, yeah, it's it's probably better than you know the understanding of most of most of the people watching AHOC. So uh, um, yeah, let's get into this. So I like to divide up degradation into sort of three different categories of uh, thermal degradation, um, voltage-based degradation, and uh, current-based um, degradation. And there's only really like one effect for each of these that that we're going to talk about. Um, and so in thermal degradation, the prime, like the, the one you mostly encounter is thermal cycling, right? And uh, we're, we'll get back to that. In voltage, um, you get um, oxide breakdown. Um, and so, and, and this one, very complicated. So it, it's like, I, I get the idea behind it. I do not understand, like the mechanics, uh, again, over my head. Um, so how do you spell breakdown? Break... I should know, yeah, I should know how to spell that considering that I have a literal video <laughs> series called <laughs> PCB Breakdowns. Anyway, I, I'm a bit nervous about this because it's just like, yeah, this this topic is uh, it's a bit much. Anyway, and then finally we have electromigration um, under current. And so anyway, let's first talk a little bit about thermal cycling. So basically, primarily, primarily this affects big GPUs um, are very heavily affected by this because basically um, thermal cycling has to do with uh, if you have your chip, like this is your substrate. So we're just going to call that the sub. Um, and then on top of that, you have your die, right? which uh, my die is very fat here for some reason. Um, it's normally thinner than that. It's going to be thinner than the substrate normally. And you have these tiny little connections between the die and the substrate. Um, and then there's an underfill that, you know, holds the chip in place so that you're not just relying on the tiny little connections to hold it in place. And then under the substrate, you know, you either have uh, pins coming off of that that go into a socket or you have LANs um, that connect to a socket, right? Um, like an LGA socket, or you have a ball grid array where you have solder balls under the substrate, which then attach the substrate to a PCB. So you have a bunch of different options for how that substrate is attached to a PCB, but thermal, uh, thermal cycling primarily affects the, the big GPUs. So we're, we're going to look at this sort of in the substrate with BGA because that's what you get big, like all GPUs in actually. So the basic issue is that the die is made of silicon. Um, right, and this right here is made of copper plus uh, a variety of different materials depending on, you know, how expensive the substrate has to, like, what cost the substrate is supposed to have, um, what kind of uh, performance the substrate is supposed to have, so copper plus something, right? Um, basically, the point is this isn't silicon. 
Um, and then down here we have more copper plus something in the form of the PCB, right? Again, the material um, in the PCB can change based on performance uh, requirements and that kind of thing. So anyway, um, the basic issue is the silicon um, gets hot um, from one location and that location is like right here. Right, so all of the heat is generated like well, actually, it's not even like squ squiggly like that. Like literally, the the bottom couple, you know, micrometers of the die get very very hot. Um, so the problem is this gets hot before everything else does. So this this part of the chip starts expanding before uh, literally everything else when the the chip heats up and cools down. So you know, as things get hotter, they expand. Um, Actually, it's just fine to have that in orange, in my opinion. So, you know, th this will expand first, and then the substrate will expand after that. And the basic issue is that there's going to be a mismatch in the uh, expansion rate of the silicon and the copper. Now, uh, the substrate material is actually often, like, part of the selection process for the substrate material is to have a substrate that isn't horrifically mismatched in terms of its thermal expansion coefficient relative to the dye but um, it's it's not the same material. And also the dye gets hot before everything else does. So the, the dye is gonna have sort of a head start on the whole expansion than the, the rest of the, than the rest of the actual, um, like, you know, well, actually, what would you call this? Then the rest of the GPU, let's put it that way. Um, so basically the issue is that, you know, um, as the as the dye expands and shrinks, as it cools down and heats up, and similarly the sub substrate expands and shrinks, um, these tiny little connections down here, they get, you know, pulled this way and that way, and over time they'll break down, and that, that can cause um, artifacting, right? That's, that's the really common one. Uh, GPU doesn't uh, work when you install the drivers. That, that's another common one. Literally just a black screen, that's, that's another one that that causes. Um, so, yeah, basically th this getting smashed up causes the majority of the, like, no, no display, no, drivers don't install, random artifacting. All of those are basically caused by, by this failing. Um, and then, of course, the, the BGA can fail as well, but the, the thing is, it's kind of fiddly to troubleshoot which part actually failed, because if you reball the entire chip, you're actually going to indirectly thermal shock this, um, and this right here can be, like, because this is super fine, um, you can actually thermal shock it back into alignment a lot of the time, so... Like, the solder balls are lead-free, so if you want to reflow the solder balls, you need to heat these up to, like, 230 degrees. Um, though, admittedly, it's probably, like, 227. Point is, very hot. Um, on the flip side, you can actually get these to sort of reconnect. Um, and they are actually a soldered type of connection, but the thing is, you can't... Like, from everything I've read, you can't practically reflow those because the uh, underfill that you have basically just completely screws that up. Um, but, uh, you can thermal shock these back to life. So if you heat these up to say just 130 degrees, um, if you get lucky, it'll often start working again. This is part of the, re this is like the main reason why the oven trick where people would put their GPU in an oven at 170 degrees, which doesn't reflow anything because you're 60 degrees below the melting point of the actual solder balls, as well as the actual lead free solder used for these connections. Um, that, that's why the GPU will start working after that. Um, if you if you do like a low low temperature uh, GPU bake, you're not reflowing anything. You're just kind of thermal shocking the 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 micro like the solder bumps under the between the die and the substrate back into back into alignment. Now the thing with uh, with this affecting especially big GPUs, there's sort of two two reasons to that. One, if you have a chip that's you know say 20 millimeters by uh, you know, 20 x 20 millimeters, and it expands by 1% in both directions, then now it's 20.2 by 20.2, you know, um, I mean, plus 1%, right? Then it'll be now 20.2 by 20.2. Um, so it's increased in size by 0 0.2 millimeters. Now this is massively exaggerated, like, you know, of, like this, that, that is like a, it's very exaggerated so that I don't have to write out a bunch of zeros, right? But the point is, if you have a smaller chip, um, say a 10 by 10 chip, 
and that expands by the same amount because it goes through the exact same thermal cycle and it's the same material, right? It's both, both of the chips are going to be made of silicon. Um, so they're going to have the same thermal coefficient of, uh, no, coefficient of uh, thermal expansion. Um, so, you know, that expands by 1%. Well, it's going to end up at only 10.1 by 10.1. So with this upper um, larger chip, the actual... Uh, distance that, you know, one of these connections might be displaced by is uh, twice as big as it could be on the half as large chip, right? And again, like, this is massively exaggerated, so I don't have to write out, like, 10.0001, right? Because that's no fun. Um, and also, I'd have to calculate, like, what that is in percentage, and that's no fun either. Anyway, so... You know, um, so basically with the larger chip, um, you put more strain on the connections just because a larger chip will actually end up in terms of final distance that like the maximum distance change for any connection is larger on a larger chip. Also, you know, you just have more connections, so there's more of them to break. And the probability that you're going to break one is kind of higher because of that. Not that, you know, it's really that dependent on that part of the aspect. The other thing is big GPUs get very hot, um, right? So... Um, you know, and big GPUs at this point, you might be like, so what do you consider a big GPU? Well, so for NVIDIA side, you know, we're, we're talking about like GTX 480s, 580s, and I, 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 I'm, I'm fully aware that there are GPUs before the GTX 480 that the oven trick works on. It's just that I literally don't know what they're called because I don't really care about a hardware older than DirectX 11. So <laughs> that's like, if it can't run DirectX 11, then I probably don't care that much about what it is. Um, Anyway, GTX 480, 580, 780 Ti's, 980 Ti's, right? All of these massive chipped GPUs. Uh, yeah, they, they have pretty high uh, failure rates due to basically the die just thermal cycling itself out of alignment with the substrate and then they stop working. Um, and a big part of this, and like so far, I, I've not heard of like, uh, I've not seen many cases of 1080 Ti's doing this yet. Um, and, you know, maybe for the 1080 Ti manufacturing process, because it's on 60 nanometer TSMC, it might have a new uh, bonding method to the substrate. But I think maybe the 1080 Ti just isn't big enough. The 2080 Ti, on the other hand, um, those are huge. Like, those are absolutely titanic dies. And, uh, you know, I, it's just... I, I really do wonder if, like, in, a, you know, three, four, five years, 2080 Ti's won't be just dropping, like dying off very very rapidly because the 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 die is just so damn big and um yeah like it tends to be a general problem with very large gpus where they will thermal cycle themselves to death um similarly on the amd side you know you have the hd uh, 7970 which is not that big but yeah the these are affected by this quite a lot and i'd actually blame that probably on the cooling system more so than the actual just die size alone um, so 7970s tend to do this, 290s and 290Xs, of course, right? Like 290Xs and 290s are especially bad with this. And the reasoning there is very, very simple. AMD has these, the reference models are spec 95 degrees Celsius operating temperature. Like they will not thermal throttle until they're above 95. Um, which is, of course, terrible for the thermal cycling situation because the bigger the temperature range that you run the card at, the worse, right? And, of course, people turn their systems off, so room temperature for, for a lot of people is going to be anywhere between, say, 20 and, like, 30, well, eh, yeah, summer, summer in Europe, um, 35 degrees room temperature because a lot of Europe doesn't have AC. Um, so, yeah, 20 to 35 degrees Celsius, you know, and, uh, you know, idle temperature to 95 degrees full load on a, on a 290X. And this is a big chip. Like, it's slightly smaller than a 780 Ti, but it's still a very big chip. Now, Fury Xs have an interposer, so I have no idea how the interposer actually affects things. It might actually improve the lifespan because, sure, the die is, at, like, the die of a Fury X is even bigger than a 290X, but, uh, um, like... I have a suspicion, like, the interposer is also silicon. So the die itself expanding at a different, like, having an expansion problem relative to the interposer, um, you still have the whole, like, the die heats up first problem, but at least it's heating, like, it's silicon next, right? And then the interposer itself can is made on a much larger manufacturing process. 
Um, it can probably have much larger connections to the actual like substrate itself. So also Fury X's have a much lower maximum operating temperature, right? So I don't think, because they're water cooled and then the Furies have some really nice air coolers. And if I'm not mistaken, the target temperature for all of the, the Fiji cards because of the HBM is like 75 degrees Celsius. So those I don't think, I, I'd be surprised if they're significantly effective, but they're not yet old enough. That's not to say they can't be affected. It's just like they kind of like the interposer and the fact that the like the the cooling on a lot of like those cards are not run hot intentionally um, makes me think that they shouldn't be as uh, frequently affected as say the seven nine seventy or the two ninety and two ninety X or you know the big Nvidia chips. Um, so. Anyway, how would you, you know, minimize um, damage from thermal cycling? Just just water cool it. Like, that, that's the easiest thing you can do is just water cool it. Because if you're on air cooling, your, you know, operating temperatures are going to be anywhere between like 70 and 95 degrees. Because, um, again, AMD's reference cards are just that bad. Um, and, yeah, and then if you turn your computer off, it's going to go all the way down to room temperature, right? So your thermal cycle is basically from room temperature all the way up to full load temperature. And, well, if you're on water cooling, you're, you know, you're, you're, like, if your water cooling is crap, I would be still surprised if your GPU goes above 60, right? Like, if you have terrible water cooling, you should still be able to maintain, like, 60 degrees load temperature on the GPU, Um and if you actually have a good water cooling loop, you should be easily staying in like the 40 to 50 degree range load. So you're basically cutting in half the, you know, operating temperature, like the, the, the thermal cycling range of the GPU. And that should massive, like that should very significantly prolong the lifespan. So yeah, water cooling can do a lot to basically combat this. And so, yeah, that's, that's thermal cycling right there. Um, big like primarily it affects big gpus because they pull a lot of power they run really hot the dies are really big so there's just more expansion occurring than if you have a smaller die right in terms of the the fixed distance and also they have more connections that they can break and well you know if you break like a ground connection not really a big deal if you break a memory connection bye bye memory <laughs> bye bye no, no more display for you because we can't get any data from the from the memory chip and the GPU won't properly initialize at that point, probably. So, yeah, or, you know, if you have a connection where it's just slightly out of alignment instead of fully broken, it'll be like, oh, yeah, it, it kind of runs, but it like it sends uh, faulty data all the damn time. So you get artifacting or the drivers won't be able to install because the moment you put the GPU to full speed, which is like the, the drivers when they initialize blip the GPU to full clock speed. So when that happens, it'll just crash the system. So yeah, um, thermal cycling primarily kills big GPUs, though I have heard of uh, CPUs also get killed by thermal cycling, though it takes like extreme effort to actually call it, like damage a CPU this way. Um, but it is doable. Like, it is doable. It's just very, very rare, mostly because G CPU dies tend to be a lot smaller. And, uh, well, they do run hot, but they're much smaller. And there might be something to do also with the fact that the substrate is, like, free-floating in the socket, right? Like, they're not BGA'd onto a PCB. So that could potentially uh, change the behavior as well. Anyway, so we're going to wipe all of that out. And now we're going to move on to... Oxide breakdown. So th these, which is, uh, yeah, which falls under the voltage category. So oxide breakdown. Well, um, very simply, um, the oxide in your CPU is an insulator layer that goes between the gate of a transistor and the channel of the transistor. And it's an insulation layer. And so if it breaks down, it's no longer insulating which means you now have current flowing in places where it shouldn't be flowing. And that can basically cause all kinds of issues like, uh, well, basically it breaks the transistor and broken transistors trans like just kill CPUs, right? If you have a transistor that's supposed to be uh, in some critical circuit, it's just gonna stop working. So oxide breakdown is, uh, so that's basically the mechanics of it is like, you know, well, uh, if the oxide breaks down, CPU breaks. So why does it break down? Well, um, the oxide is basically designed to handle a certain amount of voltage. Um, and if you exceed that level of voltage, um, depending on how much you exceed it, it'll start breaking down very quickly or, uh, you know, at a relatively slow pace, but still break, break down over time. 
So, um, and this is affected by temperature. So at high voltages, uh, like, um, where was I going with this? I really screwed this up. I don't want to reshoot. Screw it. We're not reshooting. I, I've shot three takes of this video. They're all 40 minutes and I, I've just given up at this point. <laughs> so anyway, so oxide breakdown. Um, yeah, you know, the, the oxide breaks down. Um, it can happen over time where if you're running like slightly too high voltages, um, as electrons flow through the, through, through the transistor, um, if you have too high voltage, the electrons can basically get too much energy and they'll sort of fling themselves into the oxide layer and start slowly breaking it up. Um, and then, of course, if you just massively exceed the voltage, then it's just not a matter, like, it's no longer a case of like, okay, you sometimes have an electron go through, like, end up in the oxide layer when it's not supposed to. You end up in a situation where it's just like, there's so much voltage that the electrons are just going to blow straight through it. Um, so that would be like what happens if you have a... Like, that, that's what kills, you know, if you have a motherboard that dies or a, a GPU that dies where the VRM, like the high side MOSFET of the VRM, like fails closed um, and it applies, you know, like it's not going to apply literally, well, depending on how slow your PSU is, um, it can apply as much as 12 volts to the output of the VRM, right? And, well, if you apply 12 volts across any transistor in the CPU, it's just going to die immediately, right? Like you are 10 times out of, like you're more, yeah, you're basically 10 times out of spec for any transistor in the chip. You, you apply 12 volts to it, you, you like, there's no oxide left afterwards, right? Like it's gone. So, um, you know, that's like extreme, extreme applications of voltage. But if you only slightly exceed the, the maximum operating volt, like if you only like run slightly too high voltages, it'll take time for the oxide to break down. But at the same time, that's like, it, electro migration also takes time so i don't have like specific experiences with like slow like i can't point to a cpu that i degraded and go like this was oxide breakdown whereas that was electro migration because both of them take time and it's basically impossible for me to to like you know tell them apart um so yeah Though, actually, no, I do have a CPU that I suspect had oxide breakdown because it behaves very weird if you try overvolting it these days. Um, like, it used to, like, I, I've heard of chips where if you degra degrade them, they'll just, like, they'll just stop, like, they'll, the, the voltage requirements for certain, for, like, for the same frequency will go up. Whereas I have a chip, like, I had a chip where instead of the voltage requirement going up, the maximum frequency just went straight down. And the voltage requirement didn't, like, massively change um, as the chip would still do something like it went from doing like 4.7 gigahertz to like doing 4.2 gigahertz um, but at like 1.15 volts and if you actually shoved more voltage into it it would just get more unstable so that I would say is not a electro migration because electro migration just damages the metal layers whereas that chip has something wrong with its transistors which would I assume indicate uh, oxide breakdown damage. Also, well, the thing is, at the same time, that chip basically spent a couple seconds at, like, 1.8 volts. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, that. that's still not exactly, like, a slow application of excessive voltage. That's, like, um, that's just very short-term exposure to, like, very high, vol like, yeah, by, by, uh, by 22 nanometer Intel standards, very high voltage, right? So, yeah, it's, it's really like, this one's really hard to judge when you actually incur it. On the flip side, I do know of one CPU which I outright killed, where it was basically a case of, I tried to turn it on at 2 volts uh, at minus 20 degrees Celsius, and it just immediately died. Like, it never even got past the post-process because the motherboard turned, the, like, the VRM turned on and the CPU was dead. Um, so, that's, uh, oh, and then I have GPUs where, you know, like, they'd have some, like, um you know, the VRM would be broken and it would apply two volts to the die and the die would be gone. Actually, I have a 290X where I think I did that by accident. Um, but again, like they're all like extreme voltage excess, like basically booting chips, like basically all my experiences that I would consider oxide breakdown are like 1.8 volts plus. Um, so it's like, 
that's not like slow long-term damage that's just like the chip got punched in the face and i'm surprised that you know it, it it's damaged afterwards so um yeah but the interesting thing with this is is like th this is heavily affected by temperature so basically say with 32 nanometer amd cpus so 32 nanometer soi amd um, what's kind of neat with these chips, you can run them at minus 190 degrees, 2 volts, just fine. Um, the chip I killed at 2 volts was minus 20. Um, so, and I should have run, run fine. Um, minus 20 degrees, 2 volts, not fine. Um, and I know this because I have an FX90, uh, I had an FX9590 that I was, uh, trying to get over 8 gigahertz with, and I did that. And then I did over 8.0, like I did 8.09 maximum with that chip. But anyway, um, to do that, I basically spent a lot of time at two volts um, at around 100, you know, minus 190. Um, whereas the chip that got the, the you know, um, well, sudden death by high voltage experience at minus 20 degrees Celsius was a AP, like a 32 nanometer AMD APU. Um, and basically what happened there is I forgot that this, the motherboard was still set to two volts and I, I was bringing it down, like I brought it up because I had a thermal paste problem and then I started bringing it down and I turned it on at minus 20 at two with the LN2, like full pot LN2 settings and it was two volts and the chip was gone. So yeah, um, basically as far like, and you know, within the... Paper, like the papers I read, it seems to be that if you increase, like as you lower the operating temperature of the chip, um, the sort of breakdown voltage for the oxide goes up. So the colder you can run the chip, the more voltage it can tolerate, um, just because like the more voltage the oxide can tolerate. So that's great. Um, that, that's, that's why you can get away with this, but this, this does not work well at all. Um, I'd assume actually you'd run into something similar with like 14 nanometer CPUs. Because the thing is, um, you know, you might think, oh, but two volts at, at ambient, that's going to be electro migration. But the thing is, two volts relative to one volt only pulls twice as much current, right? And that would mean like in order for electro migration to kill your chip at two volts at ambient would mean that the, the rate of electro migration is not proportional to the flow of current, which is like... Like, to my, in my understanding, that doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, exceeding the oxide, you know, the, the, the breakdown voltage of the oxide layers of the CPU um, and immediately killing it as a result of that, that makes perfect sense. So I'm going to go with the, like that, like th this right here being very much oxide breakdown, not electro migration, because electro migration is caused by the flow of current. And the, the current flow at two volts is not that much, like it is high. Okay, but it's not like a thousand times higher where the chip just goes from lasting because, you know, this is fine for several hours, maybe tens of hours, maybe weeks, right? I don't know if anybody's run a CPU at two volts at minus 190 for several weeks. I kind of doubt it. It would be really like that would be very expensive, right? But um, on the flip side, uh, so, you know, the chip goes from lasting like hours to la lasting less than a millisecond, right? So to me, that's like oxide breakdown, not electro migration right there. So, you know, for oxide breakdown, basically, if you're the CPU manufacturer, you know how much voltage the transistors can tolerate at what temperatures. And so you can basically set your voltage, like your power management and voltage management uh, policy for the chip based on like, well, as long as we don't exceed this voltage, it's not going to die instantly. Um, and we're not going to start causing, um, you know, oxide breakdown over time as long as we stay below this voltage. Or if we do start causing it, it's only going to progress at X rate that we consider acceptable because it'll kill the chip in 10 years instead of, you know, the next six seconds or something. So, um, yeah, so that that's like your voltage driven effect. Now, electro migration, um, we're actually going to draw something for this because... Uh, uh, so electro migration is caused by the flow of current in the metal layers of the CPU. So if uh, this is a wire inside our CPU, right, made up of atoms of copper, because um, copper currently is the standard material for, for CPU wiring, though in the past it would have been aluminum. And going forward, uh, I do believe there are certain metal layers that are transitioning from copper to cobalt. So 
um, because cobalt just works better when you have very, very thin wires compared to copper. Anyway, so basically you'd have, you know, your current flowing through the CPU or more like your electrons flowing through the CPU and let's say they're all going this way. And most of the time they're not gonna bump into any of the atoms. So that's not, so you don't have any issues with that. However, um, sometimes you'll have an electron that goes along and instead of just, you know, passing through all the empty space between all of the atoms, it'll just smash into the atom and uh, electrons are very light, but that doesn't mean they're complete, like that they don't have any momentum. And so it'll transfer a little bit of momentum to the atom that it smashed into. So over time, the atom will start moving away from where it's supposed to be and somewhere where it's not supposed to be. So eventually, if enough electrons end up doing that, you might end up in a situation where your wire goes from being like two atoms across in this section to being one atom across. And now all of your current has to squeeze through right there, or more, more like all of your electrons have to squeeze through right there, um, which means now they're really bumping into that one very frequently, right? Because th this one's all the way over there, and well, that's a big hole, they're not gonna jump that. So over time, like this one starts shifting. And so eventually you end up with something that looks like that. And now your wire has a hole in it. Um, so now whatever this is supposed to be connecting is not connected or the connection was like, the thing is you don't have to go all the way from connected to not connected. You can go from connect from connected to connected very badly. And it'll already start causing issues because um, you know, you need to deliver a certain amount of energy to the other end of this connection and it's just like, well, now it takes more time because the resistance of the wire in this one spot is much higher than it's supposed to be. Um, so, uh, electron, electron migration is basically just caused by the more electrons you shove through the metal layers of the CPU, the faster it happens because you just have more electrons hitting the atoms more frequently. But, um, there's, there's a lot of, so basically, electron migration is current um, which actually, no, the simplification I wanted was more current. And you obviously have electromigration all the time. Like any flow of current translates into some electromigration. It's just that, you know, as long as it's like, as long as the rate of electromigration is low enough, it doesn't matter because the chip's going to last 10 years or whatever, right? More current, more EM. So you're gonna get more electromigration the more current you, you push through the CPU. Now, things that cause more current, and there's a lot of things that cause more current. CPU load, or, well, just load in general. Um, which, uh, to, to make sure that there's no misunderstandings about what load is supposed to mean, workload. So, you know, the difference between sitting idle on desktop and Cinebench in Prime 95. Prime 95 pulls 25, uh, 20, roughly like 20% more current than Cinebench. Um, so how, like, I don't know if the, the, the rate of electromigration is proportional. I would assume it is. I may be completely wrong about that, but basically Prime 95 causes more electromigration than Cinebench, which causes more electromigration than your average video game, which causes more electromigration than, uh, um, you know, your, uh, your, uh, uh, like web browsing. And that causes more than just not doing anything with the computer at all. So, workload causes more current. More megahertz cause more current. Yeah, switching switching transistors on and off um, costs energy, so you it pulls more current. So just going from two gigahertz, and, and this is linear. So going from two gigahertz um, to say four gigahertz on a CPU uh, equals two x the amps. So. Like you'll literally, well, it's not quite two times, but it's ba almost two times. Like this is a very close approximation. So basically you double your current just by doubling your frequency. So that's fun. Um, more voltage, of course, causes more current, right? More volts, more current draw. Um, and this is also linear. So going from one point, uh, well, going from 1.0 volts to uh, 1.5 volts, equals 1.5x current. Now, because, you know, power consumption is a function of uh, current times voltage, uh, you actually get uh, 100 and you get like uh, more than doubling of power consumption at that point. But still, um, we're, for electromigration, we're mostly concerned with just the current itself. So 1.5x um, current draw again. Um, and the other thing is more temperature. More temperature also causes issues. Um, so more temp 
And th this one, like more temperatures is really like, I'm not gonna try to do that because that, that's, a, that's not a very fun graph. So if we have uh, current draw here, current, um, and then we have temp, then what you're gonna see, and actually I'm, I'm really stupid, you can't have negative current. Why did I draw it like that? Bam, there. So we have current up here, um, and then we have temperature down here. And so the interesting thing about this relationship is it looks like this, okay? And this, um, let's say this is one volt, so 1.0 volts. And what's actually even more interesting is as you increase the voltage, you get curves that get steadily more curved. So, you know, that would be like 1.5 volts and then two volts would be like here. Um, and the reasoning for this is, is as you increase your operating temperature, your leakage increases, but more voltage also causes more leakage. So if you combine the two, you get some very fun, well, not fun, uh, current versus temperature curves. Um, so if you crank up voltage, your current draw actually uh, increases faster as temperature increases. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the interesting thing there. So if you can get your CPU like ridiculously cool, yeah, you can get away with running ridiculously high voltage and not having, you know, tons and tons of electro migration because they do all sorts of trend towards the same uh, baseline level um, as well. Actually, like th they'll sit a bit apart, but like you're not going to have this, like the, the difference gets really big if you're at high temperatures compared to at low temperatures, the difference between the, the different voltages actually shrinks um, to some extent. Um, and I'd assume this is also somewhat architecture specific, uh, but I've only ever tested this on like what, like I've only really done this kind of uh, test, in-depth testing with like one architecture specifically. And uh, yeah, this this is what the curves look like for that. And I assume the shape would be the same, but the the effect of the voltage might change between architectures and that kind of thing. So um, anyway, so more temperature causes more current draw, especially if you have higher voltages. So that more current draw equals more electro migration. But the, the other thing is more temperature alone leads to uh, more uh, electro migration and the reason for this is as uh, you're operating like as the temperature of copper increases its res electrical resistance increases so basically the probability that an electron is going to accidentally bump into a atom of copper while flowing through the wiring of the CPU increases as the operating temperature increases so um, you know Basically, to avoid electro migration, you want to run as little current as possible at as low a temperature as possible. But um, you can also think about it uh, sort of, you know, if you drop your operating temperature enough that your current draw decreases by 10%, um, right? So let's say you're at um, here, right? Like, let's say. You, like the le like the the rate of electro migration you want to be experiencing is you know this this level right here. Well, um, at uh, you know at one volt that would be at say ninety degrees, you know Celsius. So this is like a laptop CPU or something. So it's like yeah that's fine. Um, and actually I should have labeled this EM. So if that's like the level of electro migration you want, you might be like okay so we go there. And then um, at 1.5 volts, you have to be at like a significantly lower temperature. And then at two volts, you might act like this. This might not be steep enough. It might have to be like that. At two volts, you'd have to be like here where it's like, okay, 10 degrees core temperature, right? Like that's actual core temperature. That's not heat sink temperature. That's core temperature. And at two volts, your, your like power density compared to one volt is going to be four times, right? Like your, your power draw increase going from one volt to two volts is going to be four times the... Well, no, because you're you're dropping the current draw, but but like cooling something down to ten degrees while cranking up the voltage is is going to be very difficult. So, um, yeah, um, this is also part of the reason why like people can get away with running chips on LN two without significantly degrading them unless they go really really high with them. Like you you can run way more voltage on LN two than you can at ambient because. Um, w without, you know, degrading as much, like, without actually degrading at all, depending on, you know, where you keep your voltages, right? Like, something like 1.6 volts at minus 150 probably won't do anything to a CPU that's good to 1.4 volts at uh, positive temperatures. Actually, you'd probably be fine at 1.72. Um, but, um, yeah, obviously, like, I don't have 
proof of that. So it's just like, but as you lower the operating temperature, you do get less electromigration because the copper gets less resistive, you pull less current. Um, so that, you know, decreases the rate of the electromigration further. And then you can just crank up the voltage to, to make, uh, to basically take back all of the headroom you created by dropping the current draw. So, um, that's, that's kind of that. And so if you look at this, you can kind of see how, uh, you know, AMD's, uh, boost algorithm, um, can get away with the whole one core equals 1.45 volts but 8 core uh, prime 95 equals 1.3 ish, um, right? Like, and that's 1.3 ish because I've seen like some chips will go to like 1.28 and some chips will go to like 1.325, right? And that, that's like the range they will go within. Um, and so obviously there's the factor of like, okay, 8 core load of prime 95 runs extremely hot. Um, so that's part of the reason why the voltage comes down is, um, well, I'd actually assume like the, the oxide, like AMD, like Ryzen probably has an oxide breakdown, like rapid breakdown voltage of somewhere north of 1.8 volts, I would assume. So, um, yeah, that's, that's probably really high on, on Ryzen. Um, at least based on the fact that AMD is pretty happy to just mash 1.45 volts into the chips at low loads. Um, even though, like, because the thing is, your core temperature, even at those load loads, like, that one core that's getting mashed with 1.45 volts actually gets pretty hot, right? Like, it's not sitting there at, like, 40 degrees, it's, it's doing, like, 60 plus a lot of the time. Um, so, so, obviously, I guess they're, they're not very concerned with the oxide breakdown in this, this scenario, because they know that, you know, the voltage, like, they're still with, well within the, say, voltage ranges, but when you whack the CPU with 8 core prime 95, um, the main concern isn't going to be, I, I would assume it's, well, the thing is, I also don't know if this is linear with temperature or if it's non-linear with temperature. If it's non-linear with temperature, then going from 60 degrees to 90 degrees could very easily go from being like very safe to not safe at all. Um, but uh, yeah, like, I don't know, Com like complicate again, just no idea. So we'll leave it at that. Um, now with a core prime 95, I would assume that the actual main concern is the electro migration, though there is the potential that it's actually, um, a issue of localized hotspots in the CPU. Um, though actually not really, because if it was localized, so basically with prime 95, I think the concern is you're blowing up the, the car, like power distribution layer of the CPU. Right, because if you're running one core 1.45 volts, like the current draw at 1.45 volts for one core is like, it's significant. You can easily be in the, um, you know, you can easily be in the sort of like 20 amps per core, right, for, for one core load. Um, but if you hit, uh, and I'm not sure that that's a real figure, I think that's a bit too high. I think it's closer to 50, eh, no. It's probably closer to, no, 20 actually sounds correct, so. Anyway, like one core can can pull out quite a bit of current on its own. But if you run eight core prime 95, you'll notice that um, around 1.3 ish volts, the total current draw in the CPU is like 100 amps, um, which divided amongst eight cores, you know, that's that's uh, so about 12.5 amps per core. And so I'd assume that the concern there is not, you know, destroying the individual cores. It's like the thing, the, the power distribution layer for all of the cores can't handle significantly more than 100 amps. So it's like, okay, um, you can shove 1.3 volts into all of the cores at the same time because they're not going to pull, uh, you know, they're not going to exceed the power distribution capabilities of the chip. But if you shove, tw like, if you tried to shove 20 amps into every single core, um, yeah, your, your chip's gonna die because you're gonna be pushing, you know, like 160 amps through the power distribution layer and it's gonna start degrading um, at a, you know, I, I guess that mean that has to mean the electromigration is non-linear. Well, actually, no, because at 1.45 1, at 1 volts and 160 amps current draw, like, your chip is gonna be, like, over 100 degrees. So, ha like, you're not gonna be able to cool it at that point. So that would be the other concern. Um... And I guess there might still be some localized hotspot issues. So basically what I mean with the localized hotspots is Ryzen has a ton of temperature sensors, like 
it's ridiculous. AMD's really been pushing to just cram temperature sensors all over their chips recently. And, and the whole, whole reason why you do that is so you don't run into uh, localized hotspot issues where basically if you put one temperature sensor somewhere in the chip, um, you know, if you have a chip like this, and then you have your core, like, um, well, we're not going to dr draw a real chip, but, um, so, actually, that's, so, the So, here, here's, like, our uh, memory controller, so we'll just label that sock. <laughs> or, actually, no, we're going to call that the system agent, because that, that makes, that's Intel stuff, but it, it, it makes it simpler for me. So, there we go. And then you have your cores, right? One, two, three four, five, six cores, and it's like, okay, so if you stick your temperature sensor in each core over here, then it's like, okay, so that point in the core is not being roasted alive, but maybe, just maybe, this this area right here, like this one corner of the chip, um, or actually this corner of every core when running Prime95 just gets stupid hot. Um, and so what ends up happening is um, you don't degrade this part of the chip. That part of the chip's fine. Um, it's this part that, like, you know, basically breaks down because you have a ton of electro migration in this very small port part of the chip. Um, this is also why, if you're like, why certain architectures, like localized hotspots like this, are part of the reason why uh, some architectures don't scale very far with voltage, or why as you keep cranking voltage up, your maximum, say, like your maximum. Uh, frequency that you can run starts coming down even though the temperatures look relatively okay it's just like no I'm like yeah sure the, the temperature wherever the one temperature sensor of your chip is uh, might be looking okay but the hotspot temperature might be you know tens of degrees above that and that part of the chip is now very very upset with you um, and you know that that might be the part that ends up degrading and then it's like well it, it doesn't matter if it's like one little part of the chip if that degrades then the whole thing starts having issues running at higher frequencies so um yeah i'm not entirely so anyway where was i going with this so anyway this this is kind of why you see you know ryzen's power management uh behave the way it does where it's just like yeah at low loads it runs insane voltages and at high loads you, it runs significantly lower voltages because um, the the concerns are, you know, like the the at low currents your your main like your main concern would be oxide breakdown, and at high currents your main concern would be electro migration, right? Um, so yeah, as well as like the combination of high current plus like the the temp operating temperature and maybe localized hot spots, which might actually make the oxide breakdown a, a problem as well, right? So basically. Um, yeah, th this was, this was kind of useless, wasn't it? <laughs> this is terrible video. Um, but, uh, hopefully this made some sense. Um, and, uh, yeah, basically, like, if you don't want your chip to degrade quickly, cool it down. Just cool it down more. Um, and then, and then don't run anything on it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right? Don't run anything on it, cool it down, and it won't degrade. Um, and even then, if you get unlucky, the chip might up and die on you for, for like, it might have come with, with some minor defect somewhere, which, you know, will kill it even at idle. But that that is super, super rare, so I, would, I wouldn't, I would like, be too concerned with that. Um, actually, I, I'd be very, like, yeah, th that that has to be, like, insanely rare. They, they would have probably caught that at the factory. Um, anyway, so, yeah, that's, that's basically my understanding of degradation uh, of, you know, CPUs, GPUs, RAM, um, when, when overclocking, well, in general, but mo like ma mainly the thing is like, th this is in terms of overclocking, right? It's just like, well, if you, if you drop the temperature, you can whack more voltage into it and then you can run the higher frequencies. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of that, so. You know, oxide breakdown just happens if you generally will happen if you just exceed the voltage temp like way too much. Um, and electro migration is the thing that's going to kill your chip and say like that's going to that, like electro migration is the effect where it's like you do your overclock, you do it at way too much voltage. And then six months later, you get a random blue screen while trying to encode video or something. Right. Like that. that's that's the one where it's like, OK, you're, you're experiencing electro migration probably. Because um, again, oxide breakdown can technically, from my reading, oxide breakdown can take time. 
and cannot exhibit like and and cause basically the same issues with like you can't hit the same frequency anymore and that kind of thing um but uh yeah, electro migration would be the one, like the the one that I would suspect most of the time if it's taking forever for the chip to degrade, um, and if it doesn't suddenly like if it doesn't suddenly start having like really weird voltage requirements where it's like instead of you know like with electro migration I would assume after six months of electro migration you'd be like okay bump up the voltage ten millivolts and it can run another six months before you need to bump up the voltage another ten millivolts and then you can only run it three months because the electro migration keeps like because the problem is once the wire you know start like what like um what once the wire has like one atom significantly out of position or just the, the there's a part of the wire where it's thinning out that part of the wire that's thinning out is now more susceptible to electro migration because its electrical resistance is higher than it should be so the current density through that part of the wire is now higher and the probability that an electron's going to hit a, an atom in the thin part of the wire is now even higher than when you started you know when you started degrading the chip so yeah, so, you know, like, initially it would start out slowly and then it speeds up, but as far as I know, Oxide Breakdown kind of does the same thing. Um, except Oxide Breakdown ends with your chip just outright dead, um, whereas Electro Migration, if you just back off the voltage at some point, like, a lot, um, you can keep the chip running for ages and ages and ages uh, anyway. So, um, yeah. Anyway, that's 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 it for this video. We'll, we'll see if it even ends up going public, because... Like, the thing is, a lot of the, this stuff is, like, the physics behind these effects are just way too complicated for, for me to understand. So, you know, I'm kind of drawing on what I could understand of the papers I read, combined with my experience breaking chips with way too much voltage. Um, and the problem, like, that I, that I very quickly realized while reading the papers is, like, oxide breakdown has a lot of symptoms that look like electromigration and vice versa. So it's just like, well, which one is it then? <laughs> no idea. Um, but uh, the the causes for each are like, you know, vastly different. Like oxide breakdown will kill your chip even at idle, whereas electro migration is going to primarily destroy your chip because you're using it. So, um, yeah. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Leave any. Uh, leave any uh, comments, questions, suggestions. Like, if somebody knows more about the, these topics than, than I do, and they'd like to, like, help me out with making a less um, dumb version of this video, that would be awesome. I would really appreciate that. So if, you know, you, you have a comment like that, um, you can leave it down in the description. I mean, leave it below the video. I, I can't English anymore. Um, and uh, what else was there? Yeah, so comment like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions. And if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon where you can support me directly. Um, and uh, then if you don't want to use that, there's also the HOC Teespring store. There's a new poster on there. Um, and then there's, of course, shirts and stickers and other posters as well. So if you'd like to support me by buying some merch, there's a link to that down in the description as well, um, as, as well as the Patreon. So that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.